Muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos a todas y a todos ustedes. Eh, para nosotros, los organizadores de este evento, el doctor Jafet Quintero Venegas y un servidor, es un placer realmente poder llegar a realizar este evento que ha llevado toda una logística de organización y la aceptación de parte de la doctora Julie Urbani, quien es una persona ampliamente reconocida en su campo y que de hecho nosotros la conocimos justamente hace tres años cuando empezamos nuestras investigaciones en geografía de los animales. Eh, quizá iniciaría rápidamente con un comentario de que para aquellas personas que lo deseen, que lo requieran, eh, tenemos audífonos para la traducción simultánea, simplemente tienen que salir y solicitarlo con una credencial de lector. Y bueno, este seminario es para platicar sobre la geografía de la coexistencia, es el título que Julie Urbanik nos propuso y que nosotros lo interpretamos justo como la posibilidad de reconocer nuestras relaciones como animales humanos con los animales no humanos, que desde ahí empieza el debate de en qué medida o no debemos establecer una separación con los otros similares. ¿no? Y eh, el día de hoy, Julie Urbanik, la doctora Urbanik, nos dará una conferencia sobre una visión general sobre la geografía de los animales y mañana veremos un documental, el cual también podremos eh, comentar junto con la doctora Urbanic. Quiero agradecer desde luego a el posgrado en geografía al doctor José Ramón Hernández Santana, porque él financió la venida de la doctora Julia Urbanic, y desde luego al doctor Manuel Suárez Lastra, quien en un momento más pasará a darles la bienvenida, a quien le agradecemos mucho también por el apoyo en la traducción de este evento y desde luego en las instalaciones del instituto. Iniciaría eh, comentando, eh, y lo escribí para hacer un poco más, más fluido, que palabras como especismo y antropocentrismo van resonando cada vez más en nuestros oídos y en nuestro entorno académico, a partir del surgimiento del poshumanismo. El poshumanismo es un planteamiento que, entre otras cosas, coloca en una plataforma teórica de igualdad al ser humano con su entorno. Recuerden ustedes que durante mucho tiempo la geografía humana, que resultó ser como toda una revolución frente a otras formas de geografía, la geografía humana, puso al ser humano, digamos, como en la cúspide de todo el entorno físico y, y, y social, ¿no? en todo el entorno planetario. El poshumanismo cuestiona esta idea y de alguna manera empieza o coloca al ser humano en igualdad de circunstancias en, con los otros seres, muy especialmente con los animales. Entonces, estamos hablando de que es un cambio de paradigma en el que se reconoce que los animales somos aquellos seres que no producimos nuestros alimentos, que tenemos movimiento voluntario y además una buena parte de los animales con los que el ser humano se ha re relacionado o explotado tienen un sistema nervioso central. Y aquí surge lo siguiente, los animales somos seres sintientes y cuando hablo de animales somos todos los seres que reunimos estas características que acabamos de enunciar, todos tenemos la capacidad de sentir placer y dolor y además somos autoconscientes de ello. Sin duda, este tiene, esto tiene repercusiones éticas muy importantes y nos lleva a preguntar, si todos los animales estamos en igualdad de circunstancias, ¿por qué los vemos, los humanos, por qué los tratamos y utilizamos como objetos y no como sujetos? ¿Qué tiene que decir la geografía al respecto? ¿Podemos romper nuestros esquemas tradicionales y ser sensibles y empáticos, sentir algo por la otredad que es igual a nosotros?, con los animales y replantear nuestra forma de organización social y cultural? 
En este sentido, yo creo que Julie Urbanic ha discutido bastante y tiene mucho que decirnos y estoy seguro que tendremos mucho que aprender de ella este día y el día de mañana. Julie, de verdad, muchas gracias por hacer, a, haber aceptado venir a estar con nosotros y es un tópico muy nuevo, como ya te lo hemos comentado en, en México, Incluso es muy nuevo a nivel mundial, pero bueno, México ya es, consideramos que estamos entrando por lo menos en esta universidad, en la UNAM, a través de diferentes ámbitos, estamos entrando a la discusión de los estudios críticos animales desde las diferentes disciplinas y creo que la geografía también, en donde se sitúan todos estos seres con los que nos relacionamos, eh, tenemos mucho que decir, ¿no? Entonces… Eh, muchas gracias. Ahora le doy la palabra al doctor Manuel Suárez, quien, como les comento, vino a darles la bienvenida. Gracias. Hola, pues muy buenas tardes a todos, muy buenas tardes a todas las personas que nos están viendo por, eh, por streaming, que además entiendo que son un buen número de personas, además no solo de México, sino de diversas partes del mundo. Quiero, eh, bueno, primeramente darle la bienvenida a la doctora Julie Urbanik por estar aquí. Thank you very much, Julie. Este, y, y en especial le quiero dar la, las gracias al, al doctor Álvaro López, y a, y a Jafet, y al doctor Jafet Quintero por la organización de este seminario. A mí me parece que es un tema de vanguardia, ¿no? me parece que es un tema muy novedoso y que en ese sentido es muy importante que la Universidad Nacional eh, y que por supuesto el Instituto de Geografía tenga este tipo de eventos y que tenga esta línea de investigación dentro de, sus líneas, eh, dentro de las líneas que, que, que persigue. Eh, me parece muy interesante eh, que nos planteemos después de siglos y siglos de una convivencia, por supuesto, con, otro, con, con el resto del mundo este, animal eh, y que haya pasado tanto tiempo en darnos cuenta desde el punto de vista de la geografía que hay una serie de relaciones que tendríamos que reexaminar. ¿no? Y por supuesto está, como decía ahorita el, el doctor López, hay una parte que tiene que ver con una serie de discusiones éticas, pero a mí también me parece que es, y desde la geografía muy importante, una serie de discusiones que pasan desde la parte cultural, desde la parte económica, desde la parte política, es decir, hay una serie de enfoques multidisciplinarios eh, de esta relación eh, homo sapiens, naturaleza, que es propia de la geografía, ¿no? lo cual lo hace un tema extremadamente relevante y me parece que además es un tema que, que va a tener este muchísimo futuro eh, y que eh, hay que no nada más difundir en medios académicos, sino también divulgar hacia el público en general. ¿no? Y eso se lo vamos a encargar a Marco Miramontes, que se encarga de esa parte. Este, entonces, bueno, sin más... Eh, eh, Creo que, Jafet, tú nos vas a dar unas palabras también. Entonces, le daría la palabra eh, a Jafet. Nuevamente, quiero la, dar la bienvenida a todos, académicos, estudiantes y a todas las personas que nos ven por, por streaming, este, con la esperanza de que, eh, bueno, de, estoy seguro de que la conferencia de la doctora Urbanic va a ser una, una conferencia de la cual vamos a aprender todos muchísimo. A mí me encantaría poderme quedar a la conferencia, pero desafortunadamente tengo que ir a hacer otras labores bastante más aburridas que, este, eh, que, que, que lo que sería estar aquí, que realmente me interesaría mucho, pero bueno, ni modo, eso me toca a mí. Entonces, bueno, pues muchas gracias y bienvenidos. Y bueno, finalmente yo seré breve. Para mí también es un tremendo placer tener aquí a la doctora Julie Urbanic. Para mí en mi vida profesional ha sido un referente de los últimos por lo menos cinco años que descubrí uno de sus libros y que para mí transformó mi manera de entender a la geografía, verdaderamente. Y pues procederé a leer el currículum de Julie para sepan entre sentados quién es. Julie Urbanic es maestra en estudios de género por la Universidad de Arizona y doctora en geografía por la Universidad de Clark, donde su asesora fue la preeminente geógrafa de los animales, Jody Emel. Ha dado cursos sobre geografía de los animales en programas de geografía y de estudios sobre el medio ambiente y ha asesorado proyectos de investigación y licenciatura y posgrado sobre el mismo tema. Además de publicar artículos académicos, capítulos de libro y reseñas de libros sobre geografía de los animales, 
escribió el libro galardonado Placing Animals, an Introduction to the Geography of Human-Animal Relations, que es este de aquí, y coeditó la enciclopedia Humans and Animals, a Geography of Coexistence, este de acá. Este año publicó y coeditó un número especial de la revista Society and Animals sobre el tema de conservación entre humanos y vida silvestre a través de los estudios humanos animales. También produjo el primer documental sobre geografía de los animales, Kansas City and American Zoopolis, y fundó el grupo de especialización de geografía de los animales de la Asociación Estadounidense de Geógrafos, la Association of American Geographers. Además de su trabajo sobre geografía de los animales, la doctora Julie Urbanik es la directora de la Coordinate Society, una pequeña organización sin fines de lucro enfocada en actividades artísticas basadas en la geografía y trabaja también como consultora legal de geografía social. Entonces, sin mayor preámbulo, una bien, la bienvenida a la doctora Julia Urbanic. Hola, buenos días. Thank you, gracias to Jafet and Alvaro for inviting me and making this talk possible today. It's a great honor for me to be here to talk about one of my favorite topics, animal geography. And while the talk title itself is in Spanish, it's really going to be the only Spanish that you see today, because unfortunately, I don't really speak any Spanish. I'm going to try and say one word, and it's probably going to be terrible. I apologize in advance. But please feel free to let me know if I am speaking too fast for the translator, because obviously, I want you to hang on every word. Okay? So while this is my first time here in Mexico City, I have been to Mexico, I've been to Nogales and Tijuana, of course, but also Loreto. And I also met my husband in uh, San Carlos, which is just outside of Guaymas and Sonora State. And that's also where he proposed to me. So I do have a very soft spot in my heart for Mexico. But now that I've been here to UNAM, I feel that I can say I've truly been to the heart of Mexico. Right? So go Pumas. I don't know how you say that in Spanish, but go Pumas. And I just wanted to add that I've also been blessed here by a little Mexican mini Puma. Here I have some cuts uh, from visiting my friend the other night. He, he gave me a nice welcome to Mexico with all of his little scratches. So before I begin the talk, I just wanted to provide a little bit more of a background uh, of my journey to animal geography. Because this is a new topic, a lot of people are kind of unsure how this actually happens for people. How do you become a professional animal geographer? And if we go back, I think it's safe to say that I probably grew up just like everybody else did, and that is surrounded by animals. I mean, I grew up eating animals, wearing animals. We had all different types of pets. We went to zoos and parks, and we had wildlife around us. Uh, you know, we had toys and watched TV shows. You know, animals were really just a very large part of our life. But I had a little bit different childhood in that I moved a lot, and that... Um, allowed me to see what it was like, what people and animals were like in different places. And I think it was all of this traveling growing up that helped me to become a geographer, but I didn't really know that was something that you could even do. The microphone, right here? It's not loud enough? Is that better? Closer. Closer, okay. Okay, that's okay. Okay. Okay, so just point to me again. Oh, I can hear myself now. That's probably better. Okay, all right. So I didn't realize that geography was something that you could do uh, as a full profession until I got to the University of Arizona, where I was doing my master's in gender studies. And there's a very large and very renowned geography program there. And when I discovered it, I said, this is it. I am a geographer. And I just, I never looked back. I found geography about the same time that I found out that you could actually think about animals in an academic or an intellectual way. And this was also the same time that I was coming to somewhat of, I guess, an animal advocacy consciousness. And I was doing some work in the community, helping um, on food issues and, and helping with pet adoptions and things like that. So I was fortunate to do, then go on to do my PhD at Clark University, 
where the chair of my committee was Jody Emmel, and she was is literally one of the co-founders of the subfield of animal geography. So it was really a tremendous opportunity to get to go and work with her. The field is, was still so new, however, when I was doing my work that we had to get special permission for me to be able to study my topic. And I think I was the first person in the United States that was actually able to go and do their specialty in animal geography in a PhD program. Uh, so that felt like a real breakthrough, both for Jody and for myself. Um, and so while I have worked on a variety of projects as an animal geographer, I'm most proud of these three right here. And I hear that some of you, uh, besides Jaffet, have actually tried to read Placing Animals in English. Thank you for doing that. Uh, we've talked about trying to get a Spanish translation. Uh, but this was uh, the first book that actually synthesized the field for a non-academic or an undergraduate audience. And so in that way, it was an important contribution to how animal geography was developing. What are the topics? What's happening? In 2017, I did publish a co-edited volume with Connie Johnston, which is the first encyclopedia for a lay audience that looks at 150 different topics around the entire spectrum of human animal studies. So it, we could be looking at elephants or invasive species or meat eating. It's just it tries to really give um, people a great introduction to each individual topic. And then, like uh, they said, I just this year published a special issue in Society and Animals, which in English is really like the preeminent um, human animal studies journal. And we did a special issue on human wildlife conservation. And so we collected a group of articles looking at human wildlife conservation from different academic perspectives to find out where we can overlap, how we can work together, what kind of methodologies people were using. And finally, in 2009, with Monica Ogra, we founded the Animal Geography Specialty Group of the uh, Association of American Ge uh, Geographers. There's a lot of acronyms, sorry, I have to try and remember, right? I put the website down here. Uh, it's a tremendous resource if you are interested in the topic of animal geography. There's bibliographies here. You can look at our newsletters and kind of get a sense of who we are and what we do. But the important thing about establishing the specialty group was that it gave us legitimacy within the larger American Geography Association. And so really, within that association, all big specialty groups exist and sort of legitimize themselves in that way. Right? So finally, I wanted to bring in a bit of direct animal energy here. And so I will let you see who helped me uh, with my presentation today. I serve these three cats in my house. Uh, this is Lenexa and Freya and my guy, Bubbles. Uh, and so they cried and meowed and had hairballs and you know shed all over everything while I was preparing my talk. But it also feels like an important thing to do is try and get some sort of liveliness, like these other beings and their energies, into the room when we're trying to talk about animals. And so, you know, I couldn't bring them with me. They would freak out, right? Uh, I don't know how freak out translates into Spanish, but, uh, but here they are anyways. They're little faces. They make me happy. Hopefully, they'll make you happy, right? So what I want to talk with you about today is I'm going to talk about two things. We're going to talk a little bit about what animal geography is. We're going to look at the history of it and answer that question. And then we're going to look at a couple's case studies looking at the theme of borders. A lot of us that have taken geography classes, human geography classes, are really familiar with kind of this concept of political borders, you know, whether, you know, and how we distinguish human groups in a political sense or in a social sense. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like within the field of animal geography as well. So when we're thinking about the history of animal geography, we're going to kind of walk through its development to understand a little bit about how we have shifted in our thinking about what it means to think about other species. So prior to the formalization of geography in the academy around the turn of the 20th century, Western geographic work on animals, I mean, all the way from the ancient Greeks, all the way through sort of European explorers and colonialists, followed more of a cataloging and descriptive method of talking about other species. And animals were often simply listed as just you know, one of the many things that were being found in different areas. 
But with the establishment of geography within the uh, sort of the academy, as the academy was developing at the turn of the 20th century, we get what we can understand here as the first wave, and that's what that says, animal geography first wave, which we call zoogeography. And within this wave, the focus was still on accumulating uh, and cataloging other species, but now we are really trying to understand the spatial distribution. We're really getting into some of that regular geography there. And so what we have is really a focus on wildlife. And this is, gives you an example of what one of these maps looks like from the time. This is from a 1911 atlas of zoography by Bartholomew Clark and Grimshaw. This is actually a stunningly beautiful atlas. It's about this big. It's a double page spread for each map. Um, I covet it when I see it at our local science library all the time. And today we actually see some work on spatial distributions continuing within the field of bio biogeography and wildlife biology and conservation studies. And people sometimes will use these maps still in order to kind of study historical distributions of different types of wild species, because we do have some of these very amazing records from 100 years ago now. A new way of studying animals began to come into play sort of in the early part of the 20th century and was really kind of at its prime up through the six, 1960s. And we can understand this work as the work of cultural ecology. And some of you that have taken geography classes might be familiar with, with that term. And so over here, I have the second wave as cultural ecology and domestication. So if the focus of the first wave was on wildlife and spatial distribution, Cultural ecologists, following the work of American geographer Carl Sauer, began to study how human groups, including their domesticated animals, changed the physical landscape. And so they did this in both a historical context with works like seeds, spades, hearths, and herds, which is actually very difficult to say, uh, by Carl Sauer, where he examined how sedentary animal herders in Mexico reshaped the landscape through their grazing patterns, through the ways that they actually enclosed their animals to protect them from predation. Uh, and then also in, the, in a little bit more modern time, this is, they were looking at this in the early 60s, we have this book, A Ceremonial Ox of India, by a very famous geography couple, the Samoons. And in this, they were exploring the uses and symbolic meanings of the myth and ox in northern Indian cultures. Now, geographers at this time began to recognize that the study of human environment relations must include the manner in which humans domesticated and used animals, both as an impact on the landscape, but as part of social groups' cultural identities. But what's important to note here is that the animals were not being studied so much in and of themselves. They were still being studied really as tools um, or just there as, as, as emblems of different types of human cultures. So the translation, transition into what we call the new animal geography or the third wave can be seen in works such as Yifu Tuan's 1974 book, Dominance and Affection, where he talked about the idea of animals being another social group, and we should consider them and consider our power relations with them. And he did that through a case study of pets. But it wasn't until the 1998 publication of Animal Geographers, Geographies, down here on the bottom left, edited by Jody Emel and Jennifer Walsh, and the 2000 publication of Animal Spaces, Beastly Places, here on the right, edited by Chris Philo and Chris Wilbert, the animal geography really just lands in the middle of geography, right? And so this was a very important time because it represented a dramatically different approach to the way geographers think about other species. And this emergence was a response to sort of four larger cultural processes that were happening. The first one, animal advocacy here, was the increased rise of kind of public nonprofit organizations that were promoting the humane treatment of animals. Organizations like the World Wildlife Fund, uh, you may have heard of, or the Humane Society, or PETA, kind of people for the ethical treatment of animals. And so they were doing a lot of exposés and a lot of public campaign work that was getting our treatment of animals into the public eye. Within the academy, we were getting kind of from the 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way into today, 
a tremendous increase in scientific understanding of human impact on the environment across the board. That includes on all types of biodiversity, right, and on the oceans, on terrestrial environments, right? And also from within the different parts of the natural sciences, we're also getting a lot of new knowledge about animals themselves and learning these ideas. Oh, do animals recognize themselves in the mirror? Are they self-aware? Can we communicate with them in different ways? Some of you here can think of, um, you may know Coco the gorilla. Uh, she was a, a gorilla who learned sign language. Uh, she lived until she was in her early 40s. Um, but, but she was sort of an instrumental ambassador across species, right? If we can communicate with a gorilla with sign language, that opens up a tremendous amount of possibilities of what else can be going on. And within the, the other side of the academy, the social sciences and the humanities, during the same time period, we're getting a shift in thinking about what it means to be a subject. And we're getting an expansion of discussion about women's issues, sexuality studies, indigenous rights. Uh, and, and so the whole uh, thrust of history of who gets to tell history and who gets to be a political actor is really coming wide open uh, from philosophy, from anthropology, from political science, right? And so we are also breaking apart this, what we think of as a modernist view of humans as being separate from nature. And we talk about this as the nature-culture divide, right? Where humans are on the side of culture, separate and away from nature. So that's starting to shift during all this period. And finally, just the larger increased cultural acceptance of animals. Animals are everywhere. I mean, I've only been in Mexico City for a few days, and I, you know, you can't walk five feet without seeing some sort of animal-related image um, or food item or piece of clothing or something like that, right? But we've seen a huge rise in the pet culture. We have now Animal Planet and National Geographic TV, which again helps spread uh, the idea that Disney movies, I mean, who doesn't love to cry at a Disney movie because some sad thing happens to an animal, right? So all of these changes are contributing to this idea that, wow, we really need to sort of break into this idea of what's happening with these animals. And so the new animal geography poses this direct challenge to what has been largely an anthropocentric or human-centered approach to the world within geography. And so animal geography uses sort of the normal topical cate categories of politics, economics, ethics, human environment relations, questions of subjectivity, and the key foundational concept tools of geography, place, space, scale, landscape, and power to actually uh, have a dramatically new way of seeing animals. And so what separates this new animal geography from the first two waves is the dramatic expansion of what we actually see when we look out at the human animal landscape or just the animal landscape. So it's no longer just the wild animals with the tigers or just the farmed or domesticated animals with the pigs right here, right? But we're interested in what's happening with pets, what's happening with working animals, laboratory animals, what's happening with culture and identity? Why do you have a puma as your mascot? I mean, other than they're awesome, right? But there's a whole history here that geographers can really begin to explore. And the second most important uh, piece that Alvaro touched on was this idea that animals become subjects now. They're no longer objects. We're interested in who they are and what does that mean? How do we get to know them? So this is a very brief tour of history of animal geography, but we can end here with this definition of animal geography as the study of where, when, why, and how non-human animals intersect with human societies. Feels like you're kind of important when you quote yourself like this during a talk, right? But at this point in time, the subfield itself is actually dramatically expanding. There are multiple edited volumes now. There have been multiple special, special issues of all of the key academic geography journals. There have been papers that have appeared in all the American and European journals. And again, I apologize, I don't know the Latin American journals here. Um, but we have a very, very active subfield. And the directions that animal geographers are moving in right now uh, means that you actually are beginning to specialize within the field of animal geography because 
because it is actually expanding so quickly. And so I wanted to take this sort of history of animal geography and move into a discussion of the theme of borders. And you know, I can't resist a cat meme. I'll look at any cat video you have at any time. Uh, but I thought I would introduce the idea with borders with this meme right here, which reads, what if the human is not my pet, but I'm his? And anybody who knows cats knows how horrifying that might be, right? But it really actually gets to the heart of what I'd like to ask us to think about today. And that is, which side of any situation are humans and animals on? And where are they on these different sides? So the question of borders becomes so important. And I decided to focus my talk in this way, first of all, because as it turns out, when I was thinking about it, I actually do do a lot of work on different types of borders uh, within animal geography. And so I do have a personal interest of when and how and where animals or humans are in and out of their right places. But two, the topic of borders has been at the uh, forefront of recent political debates in the United States that some of you may be aware of with our election and the issue of immigration uh, in coming across our borders. And the discourse and practices of our, the US government right now are really calling into question who counts uh, as members of the American community and how are they being seen and talked about. So I'm going to discuss this theme of borders in three ways. We're going to look at the macro scale of the borders of humanity by looking at this case study of the US-Mexico border issue, controversy, nightmare, however you want to talk about it. Uh, but then we're going to move to the scale of the urban to explore who counts as members of a city. How do we set the boundaries of what happens with other animals in these urban spaces where we are? And finally, I'm going to turn to the local neighborhood scale to look at how people negotiate relationships between individual humans and individual animals. So we turn first to what I have called here the borders of humanity. And I begin with a quote from the our US president. It says, these aren't people, these are animals. And this is a quote from one of his rambling press conferences back in May of 2018, where there was slippage in whether he was talking about migrant people as a whole or if he was talking about the MS-13 gang specifically. But regardless, this phrase jumps out at me as an animal geographer, because what does this mean, right? They are not people, they're animals. So let me state up front that there are a lot of people in the United States that feel like this. This is Trump inside a prison, and the caption reads, the wall that will, quote, make America safe again, okay? So one of the reasons that people in the United States are very frustrated with Trump, among many, is the way that he has not only talked about, but taken action regarding people trying to enter the United States from south of the border, but also from Islamic countries. So I'm not going to discuss sort of the many directions of his stances, the legality of his actions, the socioeconomic issues facing people trying to get into the United States, much less the role of the United States in their country of origin, or the issues around the border wall itself. I mean, we could spend the rest of our lives really talking about all of those topics. I want us to stay focused on that phrase. These are not people, these are animals. Because it gets to the heart of how animal geographers are trying to break open the boundary between humans and other species and why it is so important to do, to, do so. So what is the problem here? And uh, on the one hand, we have the, excuse me, we can think about this problem in two ways. The first line here I've written, boundary. Humans is not animals. And the second line reads, don't treat me as an animal. The third line reads, how to think about this boundary making. So they're not animals. Don't treat me like an animal. Let's take a look at another cartoon. So what we have here is a woman representing America. And she's facing a dog in a cage. And the caption reads, oh my god, this cruelty must stop. But she has her back to children in cages. And that says across the top, USA migrant child detention which I think probably a lot of us are aware that this is an ongoing uh, problem in the United States. 
So what we have here on the one hand is the US president saying these aren't people, these are animals. And those understandably upset with his policy, horrible policy of detaining children away from their parents in terrible conditions as being a problem because they are being treated like animals when they should be treated like humans. So in this case, we see that both sides are using this language of don't treat me like an animal, using the Im imagery of being treated like an animal or not. Um, and, and we also see here that there is an accusation that people in the United States care more about what happens to dogs than they do to people, as if caring about one excludes caring about the other. And so I would like to explain, as a response to this, a foundational animal geography perspective to this idea of humans as animals or not, and what it means to say, don't treat me like an animal. And I'm calling this sort of response here, racializing power relations via animals, the human-human political tool for power. And this discussion comes from this really key chapter called Le Pratique Sauvage in that Animal Geography book. And this chapter was written by Glenn Elder, uh, Jennifer Walsh, and Jody Emmel. And in the chapter, they explore the long history of the ways in which animals have been used to racialize and differentiate between human groups. And they make three key points about how animals can be used to racialize and maintain power relations among a dominant group. And the first one, the top line here says, like an animal. What does it mean to be treated like an animal? It means to be treated like an object, not a subject, right? We all know that if you say, don't treat me like an animal, that, that's a very negative thing. We're not talking about, no, don't snuggle and cuddle me and give me treats. We're saying, don't put me in cages, don't beat me, don't eat me, don't do things like that, right? We don't want to be treated like an animal because we see animals as others. And they talk about, in sort of the, the Western way of thinking, this origin coming out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, where we have a god that makes people that are separate and above other species which then in the history of capitalism develops into a whole system of property rights. Um, and again, in parentheses, we can put property rights also includes and still does include people, right? But also a little bit of by the time we get to Darwin and his ideas of evolutionary theory, within sort of an anthropocentric perspective, humans again become the pinnacle of evolution so that all the other species are below us all the time. Right? So always in our Western tradition, we have separated humans from animals and we've treated them like objects. And the result of that is we get this kind of language. And we also get this idea of likening humans to animals as another political tool of kind of separating out and dehumanizing. And so here we have a couple of examples of Africans being depicted as apes, and this goes back uh, you know, to European history, to slavery in America. And then we can see on the top right here, you could buy this uh, t-shirt that portrays Obama as a monkey during the 2008 election, which again is gonna be a negative thing, right? This is not a positive way to portray somebody. On the bottom right, we also have a racialized postcard. And this was a postcard that was easily accessible in New York City in the turn of the 20th century. And it says, give my regards to Broadway, and shows a very characterized uh, African-American person making them look monkey-like or ape-like, right? What is the purpose of that? To separate groups, dehumanize groups, make us see them as different. Leading up to World War II, during World War II, and again today for people who are anti-Semitic people, depicting Jews as rats is another way that we see this relationship happening. And so this poster right here is from occupied Denmark in the 1940s, and it actually says rats destroy them, and shows a picture of kind of a, a very scary looking Jewish man's face on top of a rat. Right? So when we think of rats, we think of monkeys, we think of them as, you know, well, first of all, we think of rats as dirty and scary and they're scurrying around, right? And monkeys are kind of silly or they're gross or they're not very smart. And so we're, we're putting these people in a second class citizen way. And finally, they talk about specific practices on animals that we can use to racialize and separate people into groups. And so here's my one attempt at a hard Spanish word, char charitas. 
I don't know if I did that right, but Mexican rodeos, okay? Uh, and so they talk in their chapter about how specific practices of traditional Mexican rodeos have come to be banned and outlawed in the United States, and how that has turned into a slippage of seeing Mexican people themselves as sort of people that are interested in committing animal cruelty and that the machismo culture of Mexicans is just about hurting animals. Okay? So what we're talking about is the specific practice that makes people upset in the United States is the practice called horse tripping. And that is when the vaqueros uh, use their skills to chase a horse around a ring, and they lasso the foot of the horse, and the horse falls down very, very quickly. Sometimes the horse hurts itself, sometimes it doesn't. But it takes tremendous skill to be able to do this, as does all the other aspects of the Mexican rodeo, right? But in the United States, we have this very romantic view of horses. And we think, no, this is terrible. They can't hurt people. And so we're going to ban this practice because these people are horrible and we don't want them to hurt animals. But, and so we have laws passing it. But that ban turns into a perception of Mexicans as the other, as less than, as people who do bad things to animals. Now, you might be sitting here saying, well, wait a second, I'm pretty sure the US people do a lot of bad things to horses too. Yes, we do, right? But there's a lot of animal abuse. We have horse racing, we have horse events. Animal Horses are hurt all of the time in the United States. But that's us doing it, and that's okay, right? So we can talk about when, where, and how practices are legitimized or delegitimized depending on the group of people that we're talking about. Right? So from an animal geography perspective, then, we must explore and see the ways in which the human-animal boundary is used politically to further existing racial power structures by basing differences on the underlying position that being treated like an animal is a bad thing because humans are not animals. And as an animal geographer, this is perhaps one of the most difficult things to overcome when discussing human-animal relations. That is the very anthropocentric position that we don't need to think about other species because there's really too many problems among people, and we need to focus on people first. Denying one human group a voice throughout has been a tactic used throughout history by people in power to suppress women's voices, sec, you know, people with different sexualities, people of different races, indigenous peoples, poor peoples. I mean, the list basically goes on and on, right? And geographers have really been at the forefront of bringing these voices back and under, helping us understand when, where, and how people have power or not. And we have learned that we can care about multiple types of people. We can care about indigenous people and women and gay people at the same time, and our heads don't explode, right? So animal geographers are saying, you know what? We have to start doing this with animals too, that we see animals being used in so many interesting ways in our society that we just can't not look at what's going on, okay? So they need to be given this visibility. And so then we move from this idea of the borders of humanity to the borders of urban residency. And, and I'm talking here, uh, I'm going to talk about a project that I did, and it's called A Tale of Tales, which in English is very clever, because T-A-L-E, tale, means story, and T-A-I-L means tale of a dog, right? So I don't know if it's the same translation um, nobody's laughing, so it must not be, because uh, we thought it was pretty clever, right? Um, but our study looked at the politics and the boundary making around dog parks in Kansas City. And this really helped us get a sense of, of how animals become boundary markers in urban spaces, and what does that mean for a multi-species city? And so the project was, a, was a, a, a real live case study of Jennifer Walsh's theoretical work calling for recognizing urban areas as, as, as zoopolises, cities of multi-species, rather than just cities or polises, which we see, again, as, as mostly human. And she presented a three-part framework for how we should look at cities as multi-species places. First, by studying how animals are linked to urban identities. How do people talk and think about animals? And the second is how do animal people conceive of animals being in public spaces? What are spaces used for? 
And finally, how do animals figure into the moral construction of a city? What kind of a city do we want to live in? And so to be clear, Kansas City is no Mexico City. The metro proper is about 480,000 people, and the urban region is about 2 million. The population is about 60% white, 30% African American, 9% Hispanic, and along with just a whole slew of people from other places. It's the 23rd largest city in the United States, and it was founded in 1830. So almost as old as Mexico City, I think, right? Um, the animal control estimates that there's somewhere around 100,000 dogs living as pets in the city, and we also have a population of feral dogs uh, that inhabit the entire urban space. So I moved to Kansas City in 2008 and spent the next few years getting to know the city and learning about the different animal-related organizations and issues that were happening there. And through this basic curiosity, I became aware of a very complex and heated event uh, that actually occurred when I first moved there, but that I didn't end up finding out about until later. And it was a huge political controversy about opening a new dog park in one of the neighborhoods in the city. And a dog park, for those of you who don't know, is a place where you can take your dog and let it run around like a crazy dog that it is, off-leash, uh, in some type of public place. They can be in public parks. Some people have private dog parks, um, but, but that's what it is. And I thought, because I'm a dog lover, don't tell my cats, right? But who would have a problem with a dog park, right? That seems like a great idea. I feel happy just thinking about dogs running around, right? So what, what we found, I did this with an undergraduate student of mine, is that this is an amazing story about boundary making and who gets to be a member of the city. And so let me just give you a little bit of spatial, spatial background here. What we're looking at in this particular map, you can see the blue outline. That is, gives you a sense of exactly where Kansas City proper is. And if you see the little red squares all around and sort of the yellow color there, those are the dog parks that exist outside of the metro pop, uh, proper. The first one of those was founded in 1987, and they went on to be established across the area all the way through the mid-90s. Nobody blinked an eye, nobody cared. They, they were establishing a dog park. It was all really great. And we can look here, the one that's right at the top, and it says Penn Valley Dog Park. That is in the northern part of Kansas City. And a group of private citizens got together in 2004 and raised the money and got permission to actually build, in essence, a private dog park in a public place, but it was available to everybody, right? So this was the first dog park that people had an opportunity to go to uh, anywhere in Kansas City proper. And a couple of years later, some people that were living in the south of town, and we can see like this, it's outlined in this black area right here where it says Sunnyside Dog Park, they decided, you know what, we want a dog park here because we don't want to have to drive our cars. We can't take our dogs on public transportation, so let's just do it. Let's make it happen here. So they began going through all the proper channels, doing the paperwork, getting people involved and supportive. And then some people got wind of what was happening, and all of a sudden a huge push against the dog park in this particular public park came into being. And this particular park is a large park itself. It has a lot of amenities. There's playgrounds, there's basketball courts, there's tennis courts. So people are doing a variety of things, and they wanted to use one small part of the park. Ultimately, the political uproar about this got so bad that the mayor had to intervene, and he actually developed what's called, what's called the Dog Park Task Force. The Dog Park Task Force spent two years studying the establishment of dog parks in Kansas City, looking at best practices from other ur urban areas, and saying, look, we probably need to figure this out. This is something that people wanted to do. And the end result was that they actually agreed with the dog park proponent group to say, yes, you should build it in Sunnyside Park because there are existing amenities that make it much, much more cost effective. But the politics came back into play because the mayor's dog park task force still had to go to the parks board. And the parks board ultimately overruled the task force and moved the location of the dog park away from this park to a park that had no amenities, no parking lots, no lights, no water system, no fence, nothing, which meant that the cost was going to be so prohibited the park would never get built. So it was a huge loss uh, for, for, for all of the proponents of a dog park. And when we began um, asking questions about it, I, was, I wanted to understand how the human-dog relation was being constructed by residents. What was the heart of this resistance? Um, and what do residents see as the place of dogs in Kansas City? 
So we collected data from three main sources, interviews with key individuals involved in the controversy. We did an analysis of public comments. Uh, we did a media coverage analysis and a small scale survey of a random selection of Kansas City residents. And from that, we took that information and coded it back into the themes of Jennifer Walsh about human identities, ideas about morals and ethics to see what, ha what actually happened. And so we found that the main controversy and the way that people were framing the problem was that they had very different urban identities. There was a very large population that said, we have a more than human family, right? And that's how we define family. We, we look at our dogs like our kids. In fact, our dogs are our kids for a lot of people, right? I mean, the amount of stuff people have for their dogs is basically as much as people would have for a baby or something, right? So there was a huge boundary between who saw their family as a multi-species entity or who saw their family as consisting of only human beings with a dog or a cat is just sort of an appendage. That was nice and we fed it, but it just was over here, right? So we had this breakdown in identities and people were very adamant about if they were dog people or kid people. And if you are a kid person, it didn't matter if you like dogs or not. Kids were better than dogs. And it was very, very militant voices in this way. As far as the animals in the urban places went, we saw this translation from the concept of a more than human family to the idea of more than human parks. That we need to have urban spaces where our multi-species family can actually go to. So it makes sense if we have playgrounds and tennis courts and walking paths and basketball courts where families can go, then other people should be able to go and have a place and, a, and something to do with their dog. And so this really exemplifies uh, the anti-dog park people. And this was a flyer that they, in fact, used to try and get people to resist the park. And it says, silly dog, parks are for people. Don't let the park go to the dogs. Say no to Sunnyside Dog Park. And we can see right here some echoes of kind of this idea of they have this huge group. They're all large dogs. There's no little dachshunds or little poodles over here, right? Sort of this invasive, scary force of the pit bulls and the rottweilers of the dog world. And the only good dog is a little tiny one over here on the leash. So they were just adamant that dogs do not belong in public urban spaces to the point where they produce, were producing these kind of posters. And finally, in terms of the moral view of the city itself, we saw people that supported the dog parks as framing the city as a more than human space, that Kansas City needed to get with the times. All these other cities have all these dog parks. It's going to help people's property values goes up. It helps people be a good citizen because you go out and you talk to people with other dogs, just like moms and dads with kids talk to other people with kids, right? So, other people were said no. Like, if you can't have space for your dog to run around in your own yard, then you shouldn't even have a dog in a city. And we don't want them to be any part of our visible urban life. So in a nutshell, that was kind of the themes that we came out of it. And so our aim was to explore what dog parks reveal about this place politics of, of constructing a zoopolis. And as Walsh points out, what can help or hinder the recreation of a city as if animals mattered, is the perspective of the humans. And what we found revealed a link between conceptions of the family and the private sphere that were carried out to the spaces, the public spaces of the parks, and a very clear identity as a more than human configuration. So the existence of dog parks and the struggles over creating them does represent one link between changing notions of family and transgressive moves towards a zoopolis where humans and animals can share public space. And dog parks are an example of what a multi-species urban environment could look like. But as we thought about, if you can't even make space for dogs, right, man's best friend, in an urban environment, then what hope does any other species have to be some sort of member, visible member of the urban space, right? And so finally, we turn to our third example here for the theme of borders, and that is the border of individual neighbors. And I'm going to do this through a case study on human-tiger renegotiations. And this is by a fellow animal geographer, Callie Doubleday. And this paper actually comes from that Society and Animals um, volume that we published this summer. 
And this is a case study where she was looking at the context of tiger reintroduction in a, a park, the Saritska Reserve in northern India. And so we can see from the, I hope you can see from the little tiny, it's really just right there in north central India. And the green marks the boundaries of what is today as a national park. It was first designated as a wildlife area in 1955 and became a park in 1982. But people and tigers have been living in this area, in this park, really since people and tigers have been living in this part of India, and that is forever, right? So what has what happened is that over time, um, and due to the desires of places like China for tiger parts, tigers were being poached out of the park. And by 2005, they were officially de declared as extirpated from the area. So there is a huge push for by wildlife biologists and conservationists and tourism um, stakeholders to say, let's reintroduce these tigers into the park. Because if we have tourism and people coming to see the tigers in the park, this is a way to help people have a local economy. Right? So by 2017, when she's doing the heart of her study, there are, we, we know that there were 14 tigers living in the park. And the map on the left gives you a sense. The, the geometric shapes identify the different target tigers and their habitats. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the focus groups in a second, but those black dots represent where she actually went and worked with different human communities. And the image just gives you a picture of the landscape um, and, and tagging and taking the measurements of one of the Saritzka tigers. So the landscape we can see is quite beautiful. Um, it is surrounded by mountains. It's an agricultural landscape. And it's also very heavily developed. I mean, again, people have been using this landscape for a very, very long time. And here is a picture of one of the Saritzka tigers, sadly eating a baby leopard for me. Uh, but you know they have to eat too, and some nice tiger tracks right here. So with the establishment of these 14 new tigers in the reserve, it was considered a highly successful as a project of, of wildlife reintroduction. It was the first time this had ever been tried with a large carnivore such as tigers. However, pretty quickly, people began resenting the tigers and complaining and kind of having a problem with what was happening. And so in order to understand what the problem was, Callie actually did a large focus group study. She got 32 focus groups together, and which altogether totaled 384 participants. And she discussed with them, what are their views of these tigers? And what can we actually learn? And so she wanted to understand, what is a Saritzka tiger? And then it, again, an interesting echo of our discussions of the US-Mexico border and immigrants to the US, she found similar framings of these new tigers as foreigners, as interlopers, as somewhat like invaders uh, into this particular space, because they were not properly assimilating into the landscape with the people. For the locals, this, this view was based on the tiger's lack of place knowledge or the new tiger's vagabond nature. And by this, I mean the way in which the new tigers, as they're developing their new territories, just simply moved about wherever they wanted, on the reserve and off the reserve. And this was a problem because the old tigers understood where they were supposed to be and where people would harass them or where people would let them go through. And the people also knew if they met a tiger anywhere near the reserve, which tiger it was and what kind of personality this time. Was it an aggressive tiger? Was it a mellow tiger? Was it grumpy today? So there was a very direct individual relationship between the people and these tigers prior to the new tigers. But these these new tigers were just not following the right rules. And so this led to the second framing of the tigers, the new tigers, as being bad neighbors, whereas the old tigers were good neighbors. So in the United States, we have a phrase that's good fences make good neighbors. And what this means is that you have your space, I have my space, and we have our boundaries. And there's not going to be a problem as long as you're not coming into my space, right? So the new tigers, they didn't understand this. They didn't understand you're supposed to give way if a human is supposed to be coming through, or you're not supposed to just tramp through somebody's house area in the middle of the night or any of, or, or any of this kind of thing. The local people were very clear that they had no problem living with the tigers themselves, 
But these tigers were just really bad neighbors. It was like you have a neighbor that's just playing their radio full blast 24 hours a day. They don't understand what their relationship is. And so the concern coming out of her study is the recognition that successful rewired, rewilding programs will not work without ongoing assistance for local peoples in training both the people and the tigers to understand what it means to live in this neighborhood and what it means to be good neighbors. Because the local people and the conservationists saw the tigers as basically interchangeable, that we'll just plop these new tigers in and they'll just act the same as the old tigers. Right? But it turns out they don't really do that. That this long-standing and ongoing interrelationship between individual humans and individual tigers in this neighborhood was something that had to be constantly negotiated. And so what Callie's point was is that the failure of the tiger conservationists to take into account the individual personalities of the tigers was a failure to recognize the actual interspecies relationships that was happening, which is something that as an animal geographer, we really want to think about and recognize, that we just don't see them as, as separate parts. In rewilding pla uh, places with longstanding interspecies relationships requires what she calls a complex understanding of entanglements between people. Right? And so we can live in the same place, and we can set our borders, we can have our good fences, but we have to have all the species that are participating in that. Otherwise, people are going to resent having these tigers here, poachers are going to come back, and they're going to be gone very soon. The entire process is just going to come falling apart at the seams. So this is a tremendous uh, um, um, contribution to conservation studies and to rewilding. And it comes from this understanding of, of animal geographers that we have relationships in places. And we have to pay attention to that when we're talking to people and listen to what they say. And so we've considered a lot of things today, explored the development of animal geography and explored the theme of borders by moving from the macro scale of how animal geography helps us break open the ways humans are used as political tools between human groups and to differentiate ourselves between other species, to the city scale, and then finally to a very local uh, neighborhood scale and boundary negotiations. And so I hope the key takeaway from my talk today is that Animal geography is, is really a pretty complex topic, and we can look at a whole variety um, of relationships from a variety of perspectives and begin to get a sense that really animals matter, and animals are integral to the way in which we as humans create our own human societies and the way in which we act with other species. So if there is a problem with treating humans like animals, then there's also a problem with treating animals like animals. In that dismissive, categorical way that doesn't see their liveliness, that doesn't see our entanglement with them, that doesn't see the ways in which we are all negotiating boundaries and identities together in the same places. And I just wanted to end with a quote by American naturalist Henry Beston, who sums up my perspective of animal geography much more eloquently than I ever could. And this quote is from his writings in the early 20th century. And he writes, animals are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth that we are here and they are here. And we have to see them and we have to understand them and we have to look at all of these different intersections. So thank you for your time today, gracias. And again, I extend my deepest gratitude to Jafet and Alvaro for inviting me here for this opportunity. So I'm happy to take questions. I have to put my VIP translator uh, earphone in, uh, but thank you again. Okay. Muchas, muchas gracias a la doctora Urbanic. Vamos a abrir una sesión, eh, tenemos un buen número de ti, eh, una buena cantidad de tiempo para comentarios, para preguntas. 
y eh, pues les pediría que en general tratáramos de hacerle las preguntas en español para que no se tenga que estar quitando el, los, los, eh, los audífonos. Entonces, si alguien quiere comentar algo, si alguien quiere preguntar algo, o mientras alguien se anima, eh, a mí me gustaría preguntarte algo, eh, Julie. De alguna manera, al inicio de tu exposición, eh, tú comentaste que, digamos, la geografía de los animales, a fin de cuentas, está relacionada con otro tipo de de situaciones o está vinculada, por ejemplo, con cuestiones como el racismo, como el, uh, o las cuestiones del feminismo o la relación de género, hay un vínculo. Mi pregunta sería, ¿qué relación tiene el feminismo con una geografía de, de los animales? Es decir, ¿por qué eh, de alguna manera desde el feminismo surgió una especie de corriente o de grupo de, pues sobre todo creo que mujeres estudiosas y preocupadas de alguna manera por entender las relaciones con los animales y además incluso llevaron de alguna manera estos estudios un poco más a la lucha por la defensa de los animales, por su liberación, ¿no? Entonces, si tú nos pudieras decir un poco más esta relación entre feminismo, ¿cómo nos lleva a los estudios de los animales desde esa perspectiva cultural y qué implicaciones tiene? Oh, he finishes. How much time do we have? Uh, bueno. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, is this Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So to, that's a very important question because the connection between feminism, I'm sorry, I have to turn this down. I can't listen to him and answer at the same time. You can take out your... Ah. You take this off? Yeah. Okay. I'll take this off. Okay, that's better. Okay. okay. The connection between feminism and animal geography is... And, and even looking at human-animal studies is, is a very big one. And specifically what Avaro is talking about is the development of ecofeminism within the feminist movement itself. And ecofem the project of ecofeminism is to look at the ways in which systems of power extend from human groups to the natural world. And ultimately they say, look, if we want to change social relations among groups of people, we have to change social relations between people and nature and other species. And so the reason that this really came into being is again, uh, in many cases, a lot of these ecofeminists just had a specific interest in animals themselves. But very importantly, there was a direct sense, uh, there was a direct link between the invisibility of women as members of society and the invisibility of animals and the sort of free and ongoing labor as reproductive machines that women historically have been seen as, that their job is to just sort of reproduce um, and they just work in the home and they're not really out uh, participating in the world. And we had that same idea uh, you know, around animals, that they're just kind of there. And so a patriarchal mindset looks out and sees women and animals as basically the same category of other that can just be kind of used to benefit a patriarchal or male-dominated system. And so that was kind of their entryway into thinking about it and their fundamental contribution to really, I would argue, feminism as a whole, but also to thinking about animal issues, is that these systems are interconnected that we're not going to end oppression or mistreatment among different human groups until we actually honestly look at the way we're treating non-human groups. The same mindset that allows us to dehumanize human groups allows us to desubjectivize de uh, animals. And so you have to challenge the whole power structure as it exists or you're not going to be able to change it. 
And so it was a very controversial idea when it was first began to be talked about, even within feminism. Because like I said, there was the belief that, well, there's so many problems with the treatment of women in society. Undoubtedly, there are, right? And that's not to diminish that, but it's to say, look, we have to see that that same structure of power exists over here too. So I, I guess I would answer your question in that way, in that they bring into animal geography the idea of the interconnectivity of power structures that place groups in dominant positions. Thank you. Yes. Muchas gracias, Julie. ¿Consideras que puede haber una cuarta ola de la geografía animal considerando tal vez el vínculo que se está generando con las recientes geografías veganas? Uh, do you consider that there could be a fourth wave of animal geography linked with vegan geographies? I think that that is not a big enough wave to constitute a fourth wave. I think that that is a part of the direction that animal geography is going in. And so the reason I would say that is because within animal geography, there have been people that have focused on the treatment of farmed animals throughout its history. And so while there hasn't been work written specifically on veganism uh, it itself until very recently within the field, that undercurrent has al always been there in terms of the ethics of how we treat farmed animals uh, you know, around the world. And so the reason that vegan geographies are very fascinating is because they're bringing a much more activist bent into animal geography. And that is a very important part to date, and even kind of, you can see from my talk, I mean, I, you know, I, this is pretty straightforward. There's nothing radical about what I'm saying, but the idea that you're gonna promote veganism, you're gonna talk about veganism, and that you're trying to create a world where we don't farm any animals, that's a very radical view. How do we go about doing that? How is veganism seen in society? Those are questions that animal geographers are, are definitely working on right now. And so animal geography, as an academic discipline, like many, has been somewhat hesitant to be openly activist, right? They, they have made a lot of, of academic activism, I guess, if you will, by bringing animals into the fold of geography and making them visible. But this idea that if you're going to say that all animal geographers must be vegan to be a legitimate animal geographer, uh, that's going to be a very difficult discussion to have with a lot of people within the field, right? Um, but it is still a, a hugely important voice because you know, it reminds us again that we are talking about real living beings. And I think that vegan geographies make that contribution very directly, that these are real lives, these are animals that have sensory capacities and brain power and a whole experiential way of life that we are just completely squashing down, right? So it's an important contribution, but I would not say that it's the major fourth wave moving forward. It's a big part coming in. It's like a subfield of the subfield. Yeah. ¿Alguna otra pregunta, comentario? Hola. Bueno, eh, durante toda tu exposición tú nos hablaste de problemas con animales, digamos, cercanos al ser humano o en relaciones de convivencia con el ser humano, los perros, los tigres, ¿no? Pero este, mi pregunta es si se han hecho estudios con animales que no son agradables para el ser humano, no sé, cucarachas, ratas o algún otro tipo de animal. Y en ese sentido, eh, para acercarte al estudio de la geografía animal, eh, 
¿cuál consideras tú que es la forma más adecuada de hacerlo? ¿A partir de un problema que relaciona a los seres humanos con otros animales o a partir de un animal específico? Those are, those are excellent questions, and let me see how I can answer them for you. So the first question as to what different kinds of species are being studied is, is a very important one, because you're right, and today I talked about the easy animals, tigers and dogs, right? Um, and as animal geography has developed, the types of species being talked about has slowly expanded, although there is still a preference for the charismatic animals and the charismatic mammals, right? But we are seeing really important work done on species like octopus, uh, species like fish, and the interaction between fishermen and the fish in rivers and how they actually communicate with each other. Um, and the octopus is helping us understand the consciousness and the abilities of other species. And it's also, in the study that was looking at the octopus, it was talking about how we just sort of look at octopus and then we see them all the same. We don't see them as individuals, but this is an individual. She had her preferences for what she liked to eat and not, uh, or not. And so that was important because I think it was really the first invertebrate study um, in animal geography. And so the question of things like insects or even something like mosquitoes, right? Uh, you know, th things like that has not really come into animal geography yet. Although, I mean, people are touching on it. And I think that, you know, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, I mean, who doesn't like a tiger, right? So who doesn't want to work on tiger issues? It's, you know, not very many people have a strong affinity for cockroaches, for example, right? So it's kind of the, just the personal biases, really, of the researcher. It's also the accessibility of what do other aspects of the academy know about these other species. And we're learning so much about other species from wildlife biologists, from animal behaviorists now, that, that we as geographers can expand our studies out to these other species. Um, because, you know, we're trying to look at it from spatial, place-based dimension. We're not fully trained as zoologists yet. And that's part of the discussion of talking about these animals is, is what authority do we have? What authority do I have to talk about them, right? And do I need to be trained as a zoologist to talk about a dog or a tiger? Um, and so how do we negotiate that methodologically? So briefly, that's how I would answer that question, is that it, there's just a tremendous amount of work to be done. I mean, and, and we know there's, what, like a million and a half species on the planet or something like that. So I think that there's a lot of room for up-and-coming animal geographers to find, to find, their, favorite, find their favorite animals. And so now I'm forgetting the second half of your question. Um, do you guys remember? A partir de esa pregunta es, um, ¿tú consideras que es mejor empezar un estudio sobre geografía animal con un animal en específico que, que le interese a cada individuo? o este, considerar una relación estrecha entre seres humanos y un animal para iniciar un estudio así. Again, I think that the, the approach that I would suggest is the approach that matters to you. When you are starting any kind of research project, um, it's because you're interested in some aspect of the topic, right? And so what I mean by that is with animal geography, it doesn't matter where you begin. If you begin with a species like tiger or if we begin with the, the topic of pets, that you are going to find the geography there no matter where and how you look. Um, and I think that there, the important thing is to understand what other animal geographers has, have done and how they have talked about other species or other topics, because then you're going to say, well, wait, nobody's looked at this one over here like this, and, and that's, where, that's where I can go, and that's what I can do. So it's just, there's, it's just you just enter it, and it's, and it's all there. Basically, it's just wide open at this point. Hola, buenas tardes. Este, la pregunta eh, va relacionada en cuestiones de conocimiento, e inteligencia o epistemología. Eh, 
hay muchos estudios en donde han encontrado indicios o muestras de inteligencia en diversos animales, lo cual lleva a discusiones de qué es el conocimiento ¿no? eh, y, y la inteligencia, digamos. ¿no? Eh, en ese sentido, quisiera preguntar si dentro de la geografía este, hay algunos eh, autores que manejen eh, la temática de cómo... Eh, reconocer el conocimiento espacial en ciertos animales y eso asociado a cuestiones como de inteligencia o de epistemología. No sé si se entiende la pregunta. Ok, let me try. Ok. So your question has to do with, we're starting to learn that animals have intelligence and a consciousness that sometimes maybe similar and sometimes maybe different from us. So the question is how are animal geographers studying that? Is that correct? Sí, eh, eh, y un poco en cuestiones de las definiciones de conocimiento, ¿no? Este, como eh, en las definiciones epistemológicas, este, de, de qué vamos a decir que es conocimiento, ¿no? Este, si son las cuestiones... Eh, argumentales o eh, conocimientos inferenciales o deductivos, o si hay otro tipo de conocimientos más asociados como al reconocimiento espacial, eh, intuiciones, no sé, al, como ampliar el concepto de conocimiento en ese sentido, ¿no? If I understand what you're saying, and, and hopefully I do, You're talking about, are there different types of knowledges that we are learning about and thinking about with other species? And I think I would answer that question by talking about the ways in which geography, um, in sort of its, as it moves into a post-humanist mindset, that we are starting to think about other ways of knowing the world, and we're starting to move into thinking about our own human senses, right, and, and how we are affected by the world. And so when we turn our, when we start looking at other animals, that is really the first question that we do have to think about, is, is what knowledge do they have? How do they express who they are as their species? For example, I mean, dogs use uh, their ears and their tails and, and everything for their communication and their noses tell them way more about the world and how they think and, that, and it tells them about how they think than, than for us as human beings. And so we're getting into this idea of how do you access the knowledge that other species have in geography and how that has been happening um, is by trying to enter into our senses, to get out of our brains into our senses, to try and enter into their experience. And so it is still remains like a very like human-centered process to try and, and get out of our heads and, in, and into another species. But at this point, it's the best tool that we have. Um, and there are a few geographers doing that, but that is one of the methodological challenges. And again, that's partly because We're not really trained as zoologists or ethologists with, uh, or um, you know, animal psychologists with a deep understanding of, of how individual species, how their brain structures work or, or what their sensory capacities are. Um, so I'm not sure if that, if that gets there, but we can keep talking about it. Okay. Hey. Pensaba, por ejemplo, en el ejemplo de los elefantes, ¿no? que conocen los, eh, los lugares que recorren y son vastos, ¿no? y cómo eso podría integrarse como a definiciones de conocimiento o ampliarlo en ese sentido. Bueno, pero... Right, and, and elephants, again, are a very charismatic species. Elephants are very easy to study. They're not like octopus or cockroaches or fish. And we do have an incredible understanding of the interior lives of elephants. And we understand that they grieve for elephants that die. We understand that they hear through their feet, right? That that's, you know, I mean, to me, that's such a fantastically beautiful thing to hear through your feet. Uh, and, that, and that they can communicate with each other over long distances. These are all things that, that we've only learned in the past couple of decades because we had to change the way we think about 
what we can learn and how we can study other species. Because we didn't know, oh, change the frequency on your radio monitor and now all of a sudden you can hear elephants because they're, you know, before they were just out of our range of hearing. So we definitely are getting a much uh, deeper sense, really almost every day, of the experiential lives of other beings. And, and animals like elephants have been studied a lot, not so much by animal geographers in the sense of intelligence. Animal geographers have looked at elephants in different ways. Um, but even the fact that we can have such deep relationships with elephants and that we can, you know, we've trained them. I mean, we've used elephants in, in you know, as, as workers in a variety of ways throughout human history, right? So there is some larger capacity there that we, that we do recognize uh, and we can sort of cross-communicate, communicate across species. Uh, so, it, so it is incredibly powerful, and it's always, I think to me, the most amazing thing is that we have to stop being so human when we're trying to think about how do we understand another species. We can't just ask them, right? Like, well, what do you like? Do you like vanilla or chocolate ice cream, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work the same, and we have to get out of our way, and we have to get out of our way of, oh, A plus B equals C, it doesn't work the same way maybe for other species, right? And, and that's our limitation, and that, but that is the job of animal geographers, of ethno, um, not ethnographers, eth ethologists, uh, and, and people like that that are asking these questions and trying to set up the study, right? I mean, most recently they, there is a, um, they released a new paper showing Caledonian crows, which are very intelligent crows. They're used a lot in behavioral psychology research. Um, you know, they, they can do all sorts of crazy things, but they have just recently done a study where they've showed that crows can actually figure out how to make tools in multiple ways. And so they train them to have a paper, like, you know, a small paper that they put into a vending machine and they got a treat, right? But then they gave them a large piece of paper that didn't fit in the vending machine and said, well, what are they going to do, right? Well, they ripped the paper apart into the exact size and put it into the vending machine and got their treat, right? Now, it wasn't exactly, you know, right angle cut. But the fact that they can make these leaps of understanding and they can, and they can make these associations that we normally think of as, as only a human capacity is just, is just really so amazing to me. And, and it's very inspiring. It makes me think, how much are we missing out on in our experiences with other species because we are so anthropocentric in how we look at them and how we expect them to act. Like we expect them to speak our language and understand our language. And you know, the dolphin must respond to our whistles. But we can't whistle like a dolphin, right? Well, why not? Why aren't we trying to make ourselves do that, right? So I mean, there's, there's just a lot of work that can be done. Um, and, and thinking about how we do that in animal geography is something that it's just, it's just an ongoing and very complex process, right? Okay. Bueno, pues ya prácticamente estamos terminando, pero no me quiero despedir. Ah, oh. ah sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ok, ok. Ya prácticamente estamos terminando, eh, pero no me quisiera despedir, eh, Julie sin preguntarte algo y en consideración con que la mayoría de las personas que están aquí son estudiantes, más o menos yo tengo la respuesta o por lo menos la estoy construyendo, pero creo que sería muy interesante y, eh, comentarlo para con los estudiantes y bueno, mañana tendremos también un poco más de tiempo, pero mi pregunta sería… Ahora que tú estás en una organización no gubernamental o en una que presides una también una pues digamos asociación, eh, pues nosotros sabemos que de alguna manera tú estás trabajando en la geografía de los de los animales en esta asociación. Eh, ¿Cuál es tu aporte como geógrafa? o los, los y las geógrafas, cómo nos podemos involucrar en el estudio de la geografía de los animales, muchos eh, profesionistas, desde filósofos, biólogos, eh, desde antropólogos, en fin, 
creo que geógrafos estamos involucrados en un interés por, por comprender las relaciones que nosotros mantenemos con ellos y cada quien hace un aporte. ¿Nosotros qué aporte hacemos? Te lo pregunto de una manera diferente ahora. En estas asociaciones en donde tú trabajas, ¿qué te solicitan, qué te piden aportarles, qué te solicitan y como geógrafa, cuál es tu aporte dentro de, de, dentro de tu rama, que es la geografía de los animales? Es un poco amplia la pregunta, pero va en el sentido como de ampliar la visión de la relevancia que la geografía tiene en estudios críticos animales. Okay, that, that very last part helped. Okay, all right. So what specifically is the contribution of geographers to the larger kind of animal studies project? Did I know, is that, that's okay. And that, to answer that in a shorthand way, I would say that geographers are just so adept at understanding complexity and complexity in place. Right? And, and for me, geographer is, geography is about location. Why does something happen here? Why is it not happening somewhere else? And so if we're thinking about even some, something like veganism, right? we can look at the sort of geographical development of veganism, and that is a huge contribution that nobody else from any other perspective is really going to look at. The spatial distribution of vegan groups. Why would certain religious groups be vegan or not? What, it, what is the history the geographical history of all of that, right? So to me, that is what we are bringing to the table. We're bringing to the table the understanding that these relationships are happening and they are happening in places. Whether those places are visible or invisible, they're still happening. And it's our job to sort of disentangle that and bring that all to the forefront. So, you know, philosophically, you can have people talking about, um, you know, maybe talking about the idea of speciesism and really bringing that to the fore um, and doing that, the philosophical theoretical work. But what geographers bring to the table is what does that look like on the ground? Right? Where do we see speciesism in practice? It's great. We can kind of have a great intellectual discussion and sit around and talk about it but we want to see it in the world. And so to me, animal geography is about the, the real world and about where, right? And, and it's very surprising to me when, you know, I read work by, you know, just in the larger human animal studies community, how invisible the geography really is. You know, they, they have all, we need to end factory farming, right? Well, we don't even know where factory farming is even happening. Right? What, what is it really, in, okay, it's terrible. Well, is it more terrible or less terrible in some places? Like, let's break this apart a little bit. And so geographers, because we are so good at both categorizing things and then resynthesizing them, I think that that's really the greatest strength of geography, that that's what we bring to the table for the rest of the Human Animal Studies Project. So you can't talk about animals or human-animal relations without talking about where it's happening. And yet, that's actually what has been done right, in, in, in other places. So I, that's the short and, shorthand answer to that question. Okay. Bueno, muchas gracias. Para, nos vemos mañana para los que tengan la intención de ver el documental que Julie Urbanic justamente realizó. Más o menos es un documental de media hora y la intención es observar el documental y ella nos hará algunos comentarios y poder hacer una discusión ya con un estudio de caso muy específico que ella realizó en Kansas City, entonces están muy cordialmente invitados e invitadas, gracias y me gustaría que despidiéramos a Julie Urbani con un aplauso. Y también, eh, sí, qué bueno que me dices, Elenita, eh, a todas las personas que se enlazaron, que bueno, eh, hasta donde yo tenía entendido eran varios, cada vez asistimos menos en físico a los, a los lugares porque tenemos la disponibilidad de la tecnología, pues es muy tecnología digital ¿no? y es muy bueno, pero también es muy agradable poder conocer a los personajes que son 
están marcando vanguardia en la geografía. Entonces, también despedimos a los que están enlazados. Muchas gracias y para aquellos que quieran venir, mañana también están invitados. Gracias. Bueno, por supuesto, al final tenemos cafecito, eh, galletas y si gustan platicar, preguntarle algo, pedirle su correo. Ah, bueno, está su correo electrónico ahí, por si posteriormente ustedes se quieren comunicar, pero bueno, alguna última intercambio de ideas todavía se puede hacer aquí afuera. Muchas gracias, hasta luego.